Um, so this morning, uh, we have the privilege to uh, have an open conversation with Paul Gauchi. And Paul Gauchi, uh, this is not his claim to fame. He is so much more blessed because he's a son of the living God than what I'm going to tell you. But um, people understand him to be the man who uh, has this thing, a film called BackToEdenFilm.com. It's a documentary on how to grow crops and uh, God's way. And it has helped a lot of people. Without any exaggeration, I've been to places in the world where people lived and did not die because of Paul's gardening method. It's pretty significant. And, um, and it wasn't Paul's gardening method. He doesn't take any claim on it. He just, you know, returns to God's plan in the Garden of Eden. And um, we're, priv we're privileged to, to be here. And so far, that particular film has had over... 50 million viewers, and it's that's actually the wrong number because uh, where I traveled in, in Africa, um, when someone views that particular film, it's actually in a room full of people or one person with a laptop in a in a with 12 or 15. I personally showed that video to hundreds of people, and I only used it four times. So um, it is it is swept around and. There's just power in the principle, and I think, and I want to say that as nice as the movie is and as important as it is, and I hope you all watch it multiple times, I've watched it probably 15 times, um, back to EdenFilm.com. There's something more important uh, that Paul has to express. His ministry is a fruit of his walk with God. His life is a, is a reflection of his walk with Jesus, and there are things that... You know, he's just like you and me. There are things that are a struggle for him. But there is a peace that he has that my prayer is that you would listen and hear the voice of the Holy Spirit as he just shares. Um, we didn't plan this out. It's informal. I, I did not want a script. I'm not into... Sometimes I just think we plan and prepare too much. Um... So, Paul, I, my question, I just have a couple questions for you. And um, maybe you could just start off by sharing with people how you hear the voice of God and what sort of things He tells you. Well, for most of my Christian life, I didn't know I could hear. You know, I, I have a wife who hears all the time, and a lot of people I hear all the time. And I never hear. And I'm reading the Word, I'm praying, I'm seeking God, and I don't hear. I'm looking for a still small voice and there's nothing. And my wife was, was really concerned for me, so she got me this, this awesome teaching by Mark Berkler, Hearing the Voice of God. And he's sharing his experiences just like mine. I read the Word, I pray, I see God, I don't hear. And he's asking people, how do you hear God? Oh, you just know when you're knower and you're giving all... And it just didn't get it. And he made a statement that changed my life. He says, God's voice comes as a spontaneous thought. And all of a sudden, it opened up to me I've been hearing God all my life, I just never knew it. His voice comes as a spontaneous thought. And how? And I want to encourage you, if you think you haven't been hearing, to start practicing hearing. Here, here's how you do it. You ask God a question, and you pay attention to the thoughts that come into your mind. If they're thoughts from God, He's speaking to you, He'll confirm it. Because the Word says in the mouth of truth, He witnesses, truth is confirmed. And I'm telling you, it's so awesome how when I hear, He always gives confirmation, always. And then you know you heard are you hearing me? And so, as you practice this, make make a, it's like an exercise. You get everything's developed by exercise. My muscles are strengthened by exercise. And as I exercise hearing God, I start hearing more. I am just so blessed. I hear God all day long, every day. You know. And, and here's the word. He says three times in the Bible. First in Proverbs, excuse me, Psalms, and twice in Hebrews. Today, if you hear His voice, harden not your heart. Today is very present tense. He's speaking to us every day. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. So you need to get into the habit of hearing his voice. And a good way to start is every morning you get up, this should be your prayer. God, what are you up to today, and how can I be part of it? Really, you start your day like that, and you'll be amazed at how he'll encounter you. And just, you notice I'm doing this over here? Come on, let's do it together. <laughs> because that's his heart. He loves to work with us, <laughs> because he's a good father. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Um, 
It says uh, in the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament, that an Enoch, an Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more, for God took him. Um, I think that, and we don't, we don't do any comparisons, because the Bible says do not compare yourself to one another, but you've learned some things about walking with God in his amazing nature and listening to him um, as Enoch walked. Um, can you explain to us how to do that? Well, just um, for example, when I came, I, I was raised in Los Angeles. My family grew all of our food, and it was just a great way to live. I wanted that for my family as I grew up to Los Angeles, became a place that was unfit for human habitation and not safe to live. And so I bought a place up in Washington State to grow food for my family. We drilled a well with 213 feet, got half a gallon a minute, no water. And I'm building my house and says, God, how am I going to go fridges without water? He says, come out to the woods and I'll show you. When I came out to the woods and got on the ground and started examining the soil, I, it opened up to me the power of the covenant and how God does blessings of nature. And that day changed my life. Totally changed my life. Because I realized God is there for us. His word says he's an ever-present help in every time of need. And he says you have not because you don't ask. You know, the thing I, I'm seeing about God, he's, he, he is so, um, he's so honorable. He gave us free moral agency, and he honors it. That's why the word says, draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. The order is very significant. God made the first move by sending his son to reconcile us to himself, the balls in our court. And he waits on us. He totally waits. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to push in. And when he's waiting on us, and we have, and, we, and the word says clearly, you don't have because you don't ask. You know, and I'm, I'm so learning that he loves me to ask. He's a good father. He loves to give. And so I'm just getting in a habit. So, you know, when I get my guard, he says, God, how would you approach this? What would you do here? And he just comes up with this amazing idea. I think, wow, I never thought of that. That's a great idea. And I'm seeing that he so wants to be with us. He so wants to guide and lead us. But he waits on us. And so I really encourage you, seek him, draw near to him, and you'll be blown away at how present he is and how good he is. Amen. Amen. So yesterday I had the most unbelievable privilege. No, it was two days ago or yesterday? I can't. Two days ago. Um, they all just blend in for me right now. <laughs> Paul actually pruned my apple trees. And it was amazing. Because uh, I am not a pruner. And uh, Paul walked up to this apple tree of mine. And I thought, okay, what's he going to do? He's going to take this branch and this branch and this branch. And he said, no, we're going to go right to the core of the tree. I'm going to push through all the twisted. I'm going to get right at the core and work my way out. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I don't know if you're aware of it, but anybody who's paid attention to pruning... The only culture in the world who knows how to prune is the Japanese. I'm being honest. Anywhere you go in the world, you look at trees that are pruned, they're all hacked off, you look at something in your face, and they're ugly. Totally ugly. And that's how the whole world prunes. They're pruning from the outside in. The Japanese don't do that. They prune from the inside out. They get from the inside of the tree, you see all the cross oaks, all the tree, and they open it up to make the tree, you know, everything fit and you arrange everything to fit in its place. How does God work with you? From the inside out. I'm seeing these principles in God are in everything. I'm telling you, it, He is so ordered and His spiritual principles are in everything in life. It is so awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, can you explain to, um, can you uh, explain to them um, the issue of soil, just for three yes. minutes. Yeah. Here's the, you know, um, Satan came to rob, kill, and destroy. That's his agenda. And Adam, our father, gave place to that. And you need to understand that he's a God of this world, but not by, not by design. It's by default. Can you hear me? Satan is a God of this world, by default. And you can pay attention to influence you're getting because this world is influenced by the devil and it's all wrong. It's totally wrong. 
I, I, the principle of covering is so significant in God. Everything about God is covering. If you look at nature, every living organism has a covering. We have skin, birds have feathers, fish have scales, animals have fur, and the soil is a living organism. It's living. And any time you take the cover off, it dies. It totally dies. And as soon as you put the cover back, it comes back to life. It is so powerful. And it's just, to me, it's just so beautiful, the principles. How, if you notice right now how the Creator is putting a covering of needles and leaves over the whole planet, it is coming down. Because that's just the wisdom of it. You see, as the trees took out nutrients from the ground, every fall he returns it to maintain balance and order. Where we have this mentality, you would strip the cover off the ground, till the ground, put down chemicals, and make things grow. It is totally insane. You see, it's not about feeding plants, it's about feeding soil. Soil feeds plants. And so soil should be always in a state of being fed. And when you put a covering over it, it's in a compost state, the soil is in a constant state of upgrade. It never gets to a static place, it's always getting better and better and better. I am so blown away in my garden. Every year my produce gets bigger and sweeter. It doesn't matter. I had the most interesting experience. I, I was growing a rule in my garden um, last October. It was like, you know, the, the leaves. You know, arugula isn't, it doesn't get very big. The leaves were a foot wide, foot long, three inches wide. And I said, God, what is up with this? You know he told me? This is not going to end. This will not end. And I just so love God. He, God is not static. His only, the only, only the math he does is multiplication. He doesn't do addition, subtraction, or division. All he does is multiplication. And when things come under that order, that's your only reality. And it's so fun. I mean, I'm sitting down with my wife eating broccoli and says, Carol, I've never had broccoli this good. I realize I've been growing this for, you know, 40 years. But it just has never been this good. It keeps getting better. And it's just so the character of God. He's just so good. He's so generous. He so loves to bless us. And it doesn't end. It just keeps also blood. Amen. Um, could you speak a little bit about why you don't have a lot of work to do in the garden? Why it's not work for you? And why it's just not work? God is so good. Jesus gives us the most awesome invitation. He says, come to me, all you who labor, and I have labor, and I'll give you rest. The reason we labor, and I have labor, is we came under the influence of the devil. That's why it happened. That's what happened. And I love, I love the way he describes it. Come learn of me. Follow me around. Watch what I do. And you'll find rest your soul because my yoke is easy. My burden is light. I'm telling you, it's at every level. Every level. God made nothing hard for us. He's a good father. He's, he loves his kids. And he made it really easy. And I find when things get really difficult and stressful, I moved away from God. And I pray to come back because it's not him. His yoke is easy. His burden is light at all levels. That's the reality. Okay. All creation groans in eager expectation, waiting for sons of God to be revealed. I didn't tell you I was going to ask you about this one. Can you explain that to us? I was in my garden one day, and I was asking God about pests. Because I'm having a hard time figuring out why a God of love would create a pest. Are you hearing me? Mm -hmm. Did you go to that school? They told me insects were pests in school. Did you go to that school? <laughs> and so I'm asking God, I says, God, what's up with these pests? He says, they're not pests, they're my police force. I created insects to maintain a healthy environment. And their job is to go around and take out stress dehydrated, unhealthy plants so only healthy plants produce seed and make them healthy plants. You see, if plants could be grow unhealthy and produce seed to get weaker and weaker until they became extinct. So insects are this amazing police force that remove all the weak and healthy so the healthy ones produce seed and make them healthy environment. It's a perfect order. Whenever God gives me a revelation, He always has confirmation, always. And so I had in my garden, I planted celery. If you're planting celery seeds, they're little, they're tiny. There's no way to get properly spaced, they're coming too thick. So I have to thin. And taking out these really nice, healthy plants, I'm not going to throw these away. I'm going to go plant my herb garden so I have more to give away. <clears throat> now, in my herb garden, slugs don't go there, I don't have any. So I planted all this celery in my herb garden. The next morning, it's covered with slugs eating celery. And so God talked to me. 
And he always responds with, just watch. He does that all the time to me. Just watch. And so I says, okay, I'll watch. Come back the next day, and all of a sudden, he's eating down the sun. There's no, there's no more foliage. And he says, you're going to tell me to keep watching? There'll be nothing to watch. And he says, no, keep watching. We'll see. I come back the third day, and the slugs are all gone, and the celery grew back. And here's what he showed me. When you move those plants, <clears throat> they were stressed. And they put out a signal, I'm stressed, I'm dying, take me out. And all the slugs heard it and came and cooperated. On the third day, when they overcame their transplant shock, that signal stopped, and all the slugs left. And I got that day, this revelation that totally changed my life. Everything in nature is connected with the Father, under His influence, in communication one with another for the support and maintenance of a healthy environment, except the human race. We are the only ones under the influence of the devil. And that's why the word says, it says, all of nature is groaning and travailing, waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God. Nature can't figure what's wrong with us. Why are they doing these stupid things? Why are they destroying the planet? What's up with them? Because they don't have an influence. Only we do. Mm. Wow. Mm. Wow. Mm. I have some more questions, but I just got lost in what he just said. <laughs> let, let, let me continue with, you know, when I saw how simple it is to grow things, how God made it so easy, I could not figure out how Adam, an intelligent human being who knew how to do it right, because God he for walks every afternoon and teach him how to grow in the garden. In the garden, never sweated or worked. It was always easy. Why would he, knowing how to do it right, would go outside the garden and start tilling the ground make it hard for himself? Would he do that? Are you following me? He knew better. Why in the world would he make it hard for himself and everybody else when he knew better? So I asked God. And God came to me in such an awesome way. He says, I came down to my normal walk with Adam one afternoon. He says, Adam, so far walk. Where are you? I'm over here hiding. Well, where are you hiding? I ate that fruit you told me not to, and I'm naked. So what did God do? He demonstrated his forgiveness and redemption by killing an innocent animal, because Hebrews says about the shedding of blood is the remission of sins, and he took the skin of the animal and, he, and made clothes to cover them. Are you following me? He demonstrated forgiveness and redemption. The devil came behind and said, Adam, you're an orphan. You blew it. You no longer have a father. And Adam took on an orphan spirit. Here's that reality. Scripture says, as a man woman thinks in their heart, so are they. Your thoughts create your reality. And Adam's believing, I'm an orphan. I gotta do it all myself. So God is walking through the process. Outside the garden, it took him some time to clear all the covering off the ground to expose the dirt. He didn't do that in a few minutes. That took a little while. Then he had to design a tilling device to make it. During this process, he's eating, he's not fasting. He's being totally provided for but he's not getting it. And then God asked me, and where do you think you got the seeds from the garden? I totally lost it. He's getting the seeds from the stuff he's eating. He's being totally provided for, and he doesn't get it. And when the Holy Spirit gives you revelation, he always has confirmation. So the Holy Spirit really took it to Matthew chapter five, where Jesus is giving a certain amount, and Jesus makes a statement. Consider the birds of the air, and all the animals. They don't sow, they don't reap, and they don't sow food barns but your Heavenly Father takes care of them. And then he poses a question to get our attention. He says, aren't you of more value than them? And what Jesus is saying is, the Father desired and plans on taking care of you all in the same way. But you took an open spirit. You separated yourself from the Father and you've been struggling ever since. And I was blown away. I thought, wow. And see, in my experience at my home, I'm not an orphan. I have a father. And when I plant my garden, there is so much food, it is impossible to even imagine consuming it all. And if I don't choose to plant, the plants go to seed and plant themselves. And I get it. I'm totally provided for it. There's no lack. If you look at nature, nothing in nature ever suffers any lack. There's always abundance. It's only humans that experience lack. Nothing in nature does. And it's so amazing to me how we have been so separated from God and don't see it. We don't see it. Jesus said um, to uh, the religious elite, he said, if you stop these people from, from
from crying out to me and worshiping and saying Hosanna to the Son of David, the rocks themselves will mm-hmm. cry out. So if it weirds you out that Paul said that creation has a voice and plants have a voice, understand it's right in the Bible. Um, how about this one? Um, man is without excuse for all of creation declares the glory of God. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I love the way that, the way that, um, that begins is, it says um, in Romans 1, the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen. Now wait a minute. You just said they're invisible. In the same phrase, you're saying they're clearly seen. How? By the things he's made. So no one has any excuse on their own God. God has made himself so real and so apparent. Psalm likes the man I love. The heavens declare, speak the glory of God, and the earth shows his handiwork. Day into day utter speech, night of natural knowledge, and there is no speech or language that voice is not heard. God gave him the most amazing revelation one day. My wife had, brought, had this video we watched about this in Africa. It was a small group of people who were starving that because of drought. They had no, no, no rain. And so the U.S. government, their kindness, <clears throat> brought all this food for them, big sacks of food. And these, these people who could not read labels looked at that stuff and says, this isn't food, you won't receive this. And I said, how did they know? How did they know? It was genetically modified, dead stuff. And God told me, they're so connected to nature, they recognize the counterfeit. And they refused to take that counterfeit because they knew what it was. And then he gave me a gave me a thought, a revelation that blew me away. He said, "There'll be millions in heaven who will hear the story of their redemption for the first time." And I was I just broke in tears. And, and here's the word: it says there'll be members in heaven from every tongue, every tribe, every nation. There have been tongues and tribes who have come and gone who never had their language put into writing, who never ever received the Bible, who through the revelation in nature came to know God. And they're going to be in heaven hearing for the first time that Jesus came and died for them. It is going to be awesome for us to witness and see this. Amen. You're just popping people's bubbles right now. It's a, it's a good thing. Um, so when I was in East Africa with a team of people, um, there was three or four um, refugee camps that were, that were, we had, there was, there was several hundred thousand uh, Somali uh, and Su- Sudanese refugees, and um, we haven't talked about this, but they got a, a, a very large delivery from the United States of white rice, and they have, that's all they had for a while, and people literally began dying of malnutrition, and so the camp directors began selling it as fast as they could to get other food, because they said it's not food. And it fills you, it gives you a little energy, but in order to process it, it pulls all the minerals out of your bones. And so they were eating, their stomachs were full, um, but it was killing them. And so they literally were selling it, trying to get rid of it, dumping it, letting it go. And they requested food, not white American rice. Can you talk about that a little bit? And if, you, if you look at family photographs, you know, 30, 40 years ago, we have huge groups of grandparents and, 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 and parents and children. Everyone's lean. No one's obese. They don't exist. If you look at our culture today, you look at school, these poor children that are just grossly overweight. Those children are starved at them on our full stomachs. Their body is craving minerals to create bone and, and muscle tissue because they're growing. And they're always feeling hungry. And they're eating all this dead food. The body says, that's not food. I can't make cells from that. I'm hungry. And the body can't get into the feces, so it packs it off in fat cells. And these kids are starving at the full stomachs. It is, I'm telling you, this is the work of the enemy. He's coming with a great wrath because he knows his time is short. And he's trying to take us out with dead food. If you, I think it's very interesting if you look at history, how it all began. For 6,000 years, the human race grew all around food and lived well. Healthy. In 1948, after World War II, the chemical companies who made a fortune on explosives turned those chemicals back into um, um, agricultural um, fertilizers and said, you can have this cheap fertilizer to make everything grow great. And the people bought it. What was interesting was how nature responded. As soon as they started using that, insects started taking out whole farms, whole plantings of everything because the plants were weak. They were unhealthy. 
But they didn't think, they didn't get the reality, this stuff doesn't work, so they created insecticides to kill the insects. What they didn't take into account is insects are powerful, and, and the, the, the power, the strong is overcame, and insects are no, insect no longer effective, and they make a stronger one. This keeps going on and on, and now genetically modified organisms, and this is all the work of the enemy to take the human race out because we all ate food. And when it happened, it was 1948. You know what else happened in 1948? Israel became a nation. And I'm, so, I'm sure G, uh, Satan was at the conversation when the disciples asked Jesus, when are you coming back? And Jesus said, I don't know. Who the Father said, I'll give you a heads up. When you see Israel become a nation, that generation will not pass away if I return. And if you just look what's happening on the planet today, the human race has never in all of history been this sick, ever. My wife travels the world, she teaches, she pays attention to what, what um, um, scientists are saying. They're saying today that parents will outlive their children. This has never happened in history, ever. And this is the enemy. Come to the earth prayer breath because he knows it's time for him he's trying to take us out. And we need to be aware. Paul says we are not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. We need to be aware. And the word says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. We as believers need to be really seeking God by the Holy Spirit, learning his ways, getting wisdom, and walking in righteousness and health, because the enemy is doing everything he can to take us out and we be aware. Paul, there are, are people in our church that um, live in apartments, um, a couple in campgrounds right now. Um, some of us in houses, some of us with only a quarter acre or less of land. How would, how would they all participate in growing amazing food and eating their own food? It's funny, the Bible says every man would be under his own fig tree on his own farm, right? That's mm -hmm. the blessing of God. Everybody would have their own space. Um, and most of us here, we're striving for that, to have our own little space. Um, how do they do it? Well, I'm going to take to pick up what he, has, what he has said. You know, God is so ordered. And, and when he put us in the garden up front, was for relationship to know him. You hear me? It's for relationship to know God. And he didn't have plan B. He doesn't change. You know how we're going to finish in the millennium? Everyone, I love the wording, everyone will be under their own vine and under their own picture. He's putting us back in the garden because we should have never left. So, wherever you live, and I love this scripture because the scripture is so awesome, it's so helpful in so many ways. Don't despise the days of small beginnings. Wherever you are, make use of the space you have and be faithful and start developing it. And you'll watch it grow. If you live in an apartment, you can use pots. If you have a piece of concrete that was using, you can get some board, make a, make a box, put wood chips in it, make a compost, and grow it in a raised bed. But just wherever, whatever space you can, in your kitchen, you can use sprouts. There's so many ways we can grow live food without huge areas. And what I'm finding about, about God is that when you're faithful with little, He gives you more. That's His character. And here's the wisdom. If He gave you a whole... He's not going to give the five-year-old kid the keys of the car. They're going to hurt themselves somewhere else. As you demonstrate faithfulness, more comes. That's God's economy. And it's just it's awesome to see you know, and watch. And so don't, don't despise the days of small beginnings. Don't think, I got it ahead of it. Just take what you have and be faithful with it. And here's the word. It's required of a steward. It's not optional of God. It, it's required of a steward that he become faithful. So as you become faithful with what space you do have, you'll watch it multiply and give you more. Amen. Um, does anybody here have any questions they just want to ask? Comments or questions? I know in our culture we don't learn by questions, but in the Hebrew culture, that was their seminary. They would study a subject and hear a subject, but they were required to ask the rabbi. Well, Paul's no rabbi, but he's certainly smarter than most of us in some of these things. So, um, do you have any questions you want to ask him? Uh, you were talking about genetically modified and stuff. What do you think about the difference between something like a fresh caught fish versus farmed? Fish. Do you see any difference in that? Huge difference. Huge. Huge. Again, you're, you're, here's the reality. You are what you eat. Everything is. You're what you eat. And that animal fed all that genetically modified, dead, rotten food is going to reflect that in its tissue. And I come back to the reality. You hear me? You cannot improve on God. 
Did you hear me? Man cannot improve on God. God, when he created this universe, this incredible order, did it from a position of all wisdom and all knowledge. Did you hear me? All wisdom and all knowledge. You are not going to get higher than that. And arrogant pride would only motivate anybody to think they could do better than God. Are you hearing me? And so any alteration of the natural order, hear me, any alteration of the natural order is degrading and corruptive and will take you out. I'm just being real. God created an order and he's not going to change and it cannot be improved on. Wow. Wow. It's no different than giving you fake food give an animal or a salmon that you're going to consume. It's huge and it's poisonous. Amen. So, yes. Do you eat meat or are you vegetarian? Yes, I eat meat, but not much. Let's talk about meat. Could, can we define meat? Can we? What is meat? It's a dead carcass. Right? How do they get that dead carcass tender enough for you to eat. They hang it so it rots. You follow me? And you hang a dead carcass, it's rotting. So now you have a dead, rotten carcass. When you cook that dead, rotten carcass and sit down to eat, you're wide awake, you have full of energy. What do you do after you eat that dead, rotten carcass? You sit down and rest because you're exhausted. How come? You think eating would give you energy. Why are you exhausted? Because it takes so much energy for your body, that all your blood has to focus on your this to break down this dead rock carcass because it's hard to do. It's not easy. And you defecate, it comes out hard, black, and sinks. Now, in our conversation of meat, what was good about that? <laughs> now listen, I'm going to talk about meat. In the beginning, God never designed anyone to eat meat because it requires death. For meat to be eaten, life has to be given. That's not the heart of God. When was the first animal killed? When man sinned. Are you following me? And if you look at if you look at the, the uh, in, in the beginning before the flood, the average age was 933 years. Average, average, with no record of illness, full health. After the flood, with the introduction of meat, where did it go? 120. Connect the dots. Pay attention. And during the millennium, for those of you who are like me, get all you can now. For the next thousand years, you're not getting, you're not getting any. Because look, because God's going to. It says in, in Acts chapter one, He's going to restore everything as it was in the beginning. In the beginning, man didn't eat meat. And it's interesting in, in the garden, the predators weren't eating meat either. Everybody was in peace. And I love how the word describes the millennium: the lion will lie down with the lamb. Predators are not eating meat because it's not the heart of God. It's not His heart. And he mostly eats meat because I feed it to him. <laughs> <laughs> I like meat. Then rotten carcass. <laughs> so, so for them, maybe they should be hearing lots of fruit and vegetables, little meat, lots of lots of vegetables. Well, let's just look. Look, you know, God in the first chapter of Genesis gave me your diet. Are you following? He didn't go very far, and he says, "Vegetables, fruits, and seeds is what I've given to you to eat." Are you hearing me? The Bible doesn't miss anything. It's all there. And, and, and your diet is really important. So the first chapter of Genesis, he introduces them. This is how you eat. Fruit, you know, vegetables, fruits, and seeds. And you know what's so you know, God has two food groups. In school, you were taught there's four. You follow me? Here's the insanity of four food groups. Protein. They tell you you get from meat. You follow me? You think you get protein from meat. Ever look at a buffalo, a horse, the size of that animal, the incredible power they have, how far they can run, the loads they can carry? Where are they getting their protein? Grass. A one-course meal their entire life. Excuse me. You get all amino acids are found in, 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 plant, in plant food. All of them. Every single one of them. Calcium coming from milk. How oh, stupid. You don't have lysine. You can't, you can't digest the lysine cow's milk. It's totally, totally causing mucus and stuff. Not good for you. You get calcium from vegetables. Greens create vegetables. I mean, calcium. We had a drought one year, and my vegetables were growing so well because it was so hot. We don't have a warm And I couldn't eat them all. 
because we just can't. And so I'm getting to the chickens. And my wife is complaining. Paul, I can't crack these eggshells. They're so hard. What are you feeding them? It's the greens. They're eating so much greens because the greens are full of calcium. And it's so bizarre how this educational system is so racked our brains to where we can't Politics. think. Politics. And we don't get it. <laughs> Everything in nature is first fresh food in season. Are you following me? Everything in nature eats fresh food in season. They carry no health insurance. They go to no doctors. They take no pharmaceuticals. And they live, they live long, healthy, disease-free lives. Excuse me. And we're intelligent human beings. We don't get it. The food coming in season is for a reason. It's, it's, it's designed. You're supposed to eat food in season. Not tomatoes, for example. You know, tomatoes is a nightshade. It's not good for you all the time. When did the tomatoes show up in nature? What time of year? August, September, when the sun is the hottest. You know why? It provides protection for, for, for your skin from the sun. I'm here, I'm telling you the truth. They did a test on, on tomatoes. A sun ripened tomato has 300 phytochemicals. 300. And, they, and they're explaining how they work. If you look at a tomato growing in the full sun down in California, Mexico, it gets 100 degrees all day long. The sun's blazing on this thing. The skin is totally smooth, gorgeous, no, no blemishes. You know, it's, it's not, not being um, exposed. In a limb, it didn't have skin as nice as that tomato. How does it do that? There's a phytochemical that protects the skin from blistering. When you eat that tomato, you get the same impact in your body. This was amazing. They tested a greenhouse tomato, which is all the tomatoes growing today. You know how many phytochemicals that they found? 50. 250 were lost with, with, with sun going through glass, through glass because it interrupts photosynthesis. Today, skin cancer is rampant. I was, I was, I lived in Los Angeles in the 50s. I'm a sister in culture. My skin's really white. Went to the beach all summer long, surfing, and I, I sunburned all summer long. My skin's peeled all summer. I was a skin cancer when I was a kid, because all I tomatoes was growing in full sun. We had protection. But today in Seattle, where there's not a lot of sun, a lot of rain, people have skin cancer, because tomatoes provide no protection. And here's the insanity. People are buying tomatoes in January. When there's no sun, doesn't even taste good. I mean, the things we do are so stupid, really. Asparagus is another classic demonstration of the timing. When does asparagus show up in your garden? Early spring. What did early spring follow? A winter when you had no greens. There was snow on the ground. Nothing's growing, and your body is craving greens. I need greens. And asparagus just pops up, says, "Got you covered." We eat asparagus. Have you notice when you urinate, there's this really powerful mineral oil in the air that nothing else does. No vegetable does what asparagus does. You know why? There's a reason. Asparagus sends roots down the ground 15 feet into the soil. 15 feet, not inches. And they're pulling that mineral content that no other produce ever approaches. And when does God have that show up? The time of year you're the most mineral deficient. You think that's an accident, a coincidence? And I'm seeing, as the more I'm in the garden, I'm seeing this most perfect design, things in season for a perfect reason. This is creative, you did everything right. And how we think we can have things out of season, and it's okay, it's stupid. And we're really, you know, depriving ourselves. Yes? I'm wondering if you could talk about um, how uh, diets such as veganism has come and become very popular. How what is? Vegan, vegan okay. diet and, and maybe why why that's becoming popular today? Well, it's become popular because we're all sick. I mean, pay attention. Everybody's sick. That's not normal. And people are coming back to what works. And if you talk to anybody who's thinking, they're telling you, eat a plant-based diet. I mean, this is, you know, anybody who's paying attention, that's what you're hearing because that's God's idea. First, first, you know, first chapter of Genesis, he said that. And so people are coming back to it because all this other stuff isn't working and we're sick. Some, some people, though, just to define this a little bit, because I have to do this since I'm a midwife, have a mutation called MPHFR. You guys familiar with that? It's because they've been giving us so, many, so much folic acid in our foods, synthetic folic acid, so it's synthetic folate, that it's causing an imbalance. And that some people would die if they didn't eat meat. Not very many, but there are people that would. And I'm not just talking because you like it. I'm 
talking about because your body needs it. And a lot of it is because of this imbalance. Because they've given us so much synthetic folic acid that it's causing a mutation in our blood. And it's not funny. Mm -hmm. So even if you buy, even if you buy processed food that's mildly pro I'm talking chemically processed food is killing us. Mm -hmm. But if you start reading labels, you begin to see that folic acid is just about everything. Mm -hmm. And that's not feeding us well. And it takes the industry forever to change. So you need to speak up and tell your grocers that you don't want any more plastic, you don't want folic acid in your, you know, foods, foods. All right, it's not gonna change, because you won't, if you don't buy it, if you boycott it, they're not gonna get any money, so that's the only time to change. Um, Paul, uh, I've known a whole bunch of vegans, and um, I think pretty much, uh, uh, can you explain the issue Honestly, we're running out of time here. Sorry, guys. Uh, could you explain the issue of really vegetables and not the starch? Because a lot of a lot of vegetarians um, end up spending most of their time on spaghetti. Can you explain yeah. that? Yeah, it's really they do. Again, live food or bread. You know, just you know, you know so basic. Live food produces life. Dead food isn't going to produce life. And so, whenever you take live food and process it and bring it to a death state. It's, going to, it's not going to be beneficial. Here's what's interesting to me is I'm running my garden. My food has no shelf life. You follow me? My food has no shelf life. I had a cup come on a tour. I fixed, I gave him a sock of celery. Celery is stiff. In a half hour, he talked to me, he totally rolls it over his arm. Completely rolls it. Because there's enzymes in food that do two things. Either turn it back to dirt if it lays on the ground, or to die all kinds of nutrients in your body through breaking it down. You see, all the food, you know, when food sits on the shelf for a week and doesn't, and doesn't wilt, that's not going to be good to go to eat it. You want live food. What well, I think is very interesting is God's order is so amazing to see it all through Scripture. Remember manna? How long did it last? One day. Except on Friday. Now, on the Sabbath, God just gave a little preservative. But I'm just telling you, live food has no shelf life. And when you're picking, getting stuff from the store that came from a thousand miles, since the shelf looks okay, it's not okay. You need to start getting live food on a regular basis. And when live food produces life, dead food produces no life. If you're eating this stuff, there's nothing in it. You're not getting nutri nutrients. You need to get nutri nutrient dense food. Okay. Can I, can I just add yeah. one more thing to that? The, the whole vegan concept is very scary because I'm a midwife and people want to grow babies on pasta, rice, potatoes, and bread, and it does not work. It's very unhealthy and makes fat babies because all it is is sugar, and it makes very unhealthy babies. There you go. Um, Paul and Carol are here in the other room, um, and uh, feel free to ask them more questions. I bless in the name of Jesus Christ. Stick around and have some coffee. God bless you.